uh, a role in obstructing the official event, uh, anyone who had a role in a coordinated attempt uh, to offer fake electors uh, that they knew were false, uh, anyone who took official actions uh, to disrupt the proceedings and to stop a peaceful transfer of power uh, in the name of one person should be held accountable. That was Congressman Pete Aguilar, former member of the January 6th Select Committee, spelling out who should be held accountable for the attacks on our democracy after the 2020 presidential election. Congressman Aguilar is not the only one speaking out. Following the news of Trump receiving a target letter from special counsel Jack Smith, former January 6th Select Committee chair Congressman Benny Thompson says Trump's looming third indictment is no surprise. He told The Hill that by the end of their investigation, the committee didn't think that there was, quote, any question that Trump's fingerprints were all over that violent day. Joining me now, former Republican congressman from Virginia, Denver Riggleman. He's also the co-author of The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. Denver, it's always so good to have you. Look, you served as a senior technical advisor to the 1-6 committee. The final report recommended Trump and others should be charged with obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to defraud the United States, among other charges. NBC News has confirmed at this time that conspiracy is in that target letter that the DOJ sent to Trump. But, Denver, you know, you actually opposed making a referral to the DOJ by that 1-6 committee. Do you still stand by that position, considering what will likely be charged against the former president of the United States? Sure, I do. I mean, uh, I didn't want a political, you know, sort of public trust investigation to go that far at that time. But for me, I had a feeling the DOJ was going to do it anyway. Um, you have to remember, I want to take people back, Katie. Are you ready to go back? I think people might have forgotten some of this. I don't think people remember about the seven hour gap uh, in phone calls on the call logs during that day on January 6th with 187 minutes. And I want to bring attention to that. You know, even though the call logs didn't reflect calls from the official White House correspondence, we absolutely know it would be ridiculous not to think that there were calls happening at that time. So listening to Glenn earlier when he was talking about intent, my guess is there's data out there, specifically phone records, emails, and other things that we didn't have the authorities to actually process that are being used right now. So for me, it's not a surprise either because I knew that there were other things out there, millions of lines of data that had not been made public. Uh, so I do, I do have some confidence uh, based on what we have seen that uh, this could be quite damning when all the evidence comes out. Yeah, but Denver, in you and your team, you did a lot of work. I mean, when I'm saying that you guys went granular, your team really logged the hours to make sure that you could link up people to phone numbers, to texts, to emails, to certain calls. I mean, your experience as ex-military in this particular investigation was helpful in terms of being an intelligence officer. Talk to us a little bit, maybe top line, about the kind of evidence and facts that special counsel Jack Smith actually might have received from the 1-6 committee and any type of transfer of data or information as he was launching his investigation that maybe serves the basis for this impending indictment. Sure. You know, what was amazing is that we had 38 million lines of data, you know, over 30 million lines of data, but sometimes we could only get one side of the calls based on what we could request. Uh, we knew that the other calls, say, would come from the White House. We knew that other calls were going to certain people with 881 extensions, which were cell phones. So we absolutely understood that something was happening with rally planners, uh, even with people on the ground, DOJ charged defendants, Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. So he's going to have access to the other side of those calls. And he's going to have access to data that we could not actually ask for. And Katie, one of those is geolocation data, finding out where people were when they made the phone calls, where they were at that specific moment. So those are things we couldn't get. However, we were able to identify the multiple groups that were involved. And we also know, you think about the Mark Meadows text messages, you think about mm -hmm. text, phone, email. We also know alternate electors and also state legislators were in direct contact with Mark Meadows too. So let's let, you know, let's, uh, when, when Glenn talks, it's very difficult not to see intent, even if you just go back and look at the Mark Meadows text records uh, or the text messages themselves. If you go back and look, well, I mean, for Katie, for instance, why in the hell was an Oath Keeper texting uh, Andrew Giuliani, the son of Rudy Giuliani, when he was working directly for the White House in November and December of 2020. Those are the type of things that are going to come out. And it's again, it should be shocking to the American public that even those people had access to the White House at that time. Well, in terms of 
people that were also a part of that day and in the lead up to that day. So far, we don't know, Denver, any of the other target letters potentially that have been sent to Trump allies and other, other members of networks that may have been involved in the violence on that day. But from the work that you've done for the committee, who else do you think could be targeted in this particular indictment, considering the charges that the media has said is going to be a part of that? The, you know, corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding, the conspiracy to defraud the United States. And are you confident, Denver, that the DOJ has captured enough of the key players in this case? Well, I mean, gosh, I wish I sort of knew who the DOJ had captured or sure. what those target letters were. We would have a hell of a conversation then because then I could talk about it a little bit. But, you know, we saw on call records there's so many more, especially during that seven-hour period. I'm telling you, Katie, I think, I think that's a huge part of this. And, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the attorneys who weren't on the, uh, on the sane train, right, who are on the crazy train are going to be a big part of this, right? And so when you look at Giuliani, Powell, when you look at Lynn Wood, or even some of the funders, you know, I, I would love to see what they, you know, have on Lindell or Patrick Byrne, who actually who they got there that day, what they funded. So I think it's going to be a combination of call records, data, but also follow the money and financial transactions. But also they probably have some content that I wasn't able to get to, and that's because of the authorities of the DOJ. And that's why it's difficult. I'd, I'd love to, to name some uh, some real names here, uh, even more so, because those seem to be pretty uh, common. But there certainly are the people I think might surprise others that, that were involved. So what we'll do then, Denver Riggleman, is when that indictment comes out and all of the co-conspirators are listed in that indictment, we'll come back and we'll have another conversation about that. But for now, thank you, Denver, for joining us this morning. I appreciate it. Thanks, Katie.